Welcome to another episode of Kibi Skein Stories, where neighbors meet neighbors. Today, we're talking about the referendum uh, changes to the village charter. Uh, to help us navigate uh, through these seven referendums, we have we welcome our mayor, Mike Davey. He's going to walk us through these seven referendums. A little bit about our mayor. He served for eight years in the village council, four as our mayor. He has been living in the key for 19 years with his family, a uh, I think I, I met your lovely wife. I have not met your kids yet, but uh, in time. But uh, <laughs> Mayor, how are you doing today? Living the dream, living the dream. All good, all good. Happy Monday. Thank you for jumping uh, on the show on this uh, on this Monday. I know that for a lot of kids and a lot of, I mean, schools and I guess government employees. Schools are in. You, schools, schools are in are today. In. Yeah, schools are in. My wife's working. Schools are public schools are in. So let's dive right in then. Let's so. Go. I just read. I have a copy here of the Islander News. A little plug there for our friend uh, Husto. Yeah, I recommend everybody to grab a copy. There's the election ready pages with all the information on the upcoming ballot. So I'll just read it straight how it is here. Kibiskein referendum one. The village charter requires capital projects in excess of five hundred thousand to be approved by ordinance. It is proposed that the charter be amended to increase capital project authorizing ordinance threshold amount from 500,000 to 1 million. So what does that mean? Okay. So right now, if the village has an expenditure of less than $500,000, that expenditure can be approved by resolution. And a resolution means that it has to come before council. There's a public hearing on that. People are allowed to speak about it. And then there's a vote. And if it's, if it's approved on a resolution, it, it's it's approved. It's done. It's in the books, and and that expenditure can be made. If it's over five hundred thousand dollars, there must be an ordinance. And for an ordinance, you need to notice the ordinance. You need two readings, two public hearings uh, with public comments, um, and so it has to be approved on first reading, and then it has to be set for second reading, um, and then approved. And I think this the the charter was changed. I think this, or rather the ordinance was changed in 2002 to make it 500,000. And, you know, that's 20 years ago. So the idea is that a million is now the threshold. Um, I understand where some people feel that having two readings is better than having one be, for, for expenditures, uh, because you want people to be involved. You want people to be engaged and you want them to have a say in how we spend our money. I get that. But the fact is, a million dollars doesn't buy you what it used to. And sometimes those expenditures have to be made in a, in a timely fashion for us to get things going. Um, additionally, and, and I will say this, and it's frustrating, you know, the, the idea that people would come because there's two opportunities to speak as opposed to just the one for the resolution, you know, people don't turn out, frankly, unless it's around election time. We, we don't have a really full chamber. Um, I would love it if people were coming out to to debate the resolutions that we have or the ordinances. But unfortunately, it's usually just a few people who come, generally the same people time and time again. Um, so I think this makes it easier for our council and our, our staff, our administration to move things forward. We also only generally have one meeting a month. So what you're saying is, you know, let's say in October we have a meeting. We don't have another meeting until December now, as I understand it. So you're, you're going to have to wait that much longer to get projects going or to get things done. If, if let's say the community center needs more, needs new bikes. I think the bikes were something a while back that we had. If, if that expenditure was over 500,000, and again, I'm just using that example, which may be absurd for the bikes, but if it's over 500,000, we've got to wait for two months when you've got people who need, who want and need to use that equipment. So I, I, I do think it, it, um, it streamlines the process for certain things, but I, I understand the hesitancy, hesitancy on this one, but I do think this is the best way to go. Okay. And, and when you mean public hearing is in during the actual meetings, people get it's, an opportunity to speak, right? It's not, it's correct. not a separate outside meeting. Like no, no, we, no, no. we want to review the park or something before it gets proposed. That's right. That's right. It would be okay. in the agenda as a resolution. You come in, you do your, you know, you, you can make comments at public comments. Um, and when a resolution pops, we'll ask people if they want to speak. And then, you know, we vote. And that that's the decision. Again, I'm not going to be on council when this is moved forward. But I do think it's a good thing. It's a good tool to, um, 
it, it streamlines, as I said, streamlines the process. We put a lot before this council and given what we're going to be doing over the next, you know, five, 10, 15 years, I think, I think we need to focus on the bigger items in terms of ordinances. Not that these expenditures aren't important, but if we decide, generally these things are, are items that we're going one way or the other, regardless, right? I mean, it, we've had resolutions where council has told staff, hey, go back and see if you can get that number down. Let's, let's see if we can get more, let's see if we get this more cheaply or, or let's, let's work it in a different way. So it's not that council isn't going to look at these items. They are, they're going to, believe me, the, the folks up there really get into the issues and, and un, try and understand why we're making the expenditure and if we can save money. But in this way, it's simply going from an ordinance to a resolution, which just streamlines the process. So for when you mentioned, I have two questions um, about public, I mean, the ability for the public to speak, how does sure. that work? Do they need to sign up? Do they just show up it, or what is it? Yeah. It, it's ideal if they show up at least on zoom um, so they can speak, but yeah, I, I generally during the meetings and, and I would like, yeah, hopefully, in the, I, I know they're working on it. Our zoom has never been really good. Frankly, it's very difficult. You know, it, it's like the nuclear codes. I mean, you've got to enter 18 <laughs> digits and, and, and you got to hop on one foot to, to get in to speak from the Zoom. And people have had difficulty speaking uh, through the Zoom. And that, that's a little frustrating because, you know, it's important to hear from residents. But uh, at every meeting, we have a public comment. We have two public comments times. We have one early on, usually generally right after um, brief comments by council. Then there'll be public comments. Then we'll do special uh special presentations. And then there's one later in the evening. Um, that's an opportunity. And then if there's something on the, uh, that somebody wants to specifically speak to ordinances, we open for public uh, comment and, and referendum, I keep saying referendum, res resolution issues generally, if it's something, especially if it's something charged, we will certainly allow the public to speak. I think it's better to allow the public speak than not. Okay. All right. And the, the other, what, what, and regarding speaking opportunities, can people also um, request more time? Because it's like two or three minutes, right? It's three minutes. I'm sorry. Yes, it's a, you get three minutes. Um, generally, in the public comments, it, it, this is one of the toughest thing a mayor has to do. Is is you've got to be uniform with everybody. You know, once you start letting one person go over their time, then you've got to let everybody go over their time. So I do try mm -hmm. and limit it. Um, frankly, if it's if it's a former council member. Um, then I will give them a little more time sometimes if, it, if it's an issue that they've worked on previously. Uh, but generally, I try to keep people to three minutes. You know, if they go over a little, a little bit or if it's if there's not a lot of people in attendance, I might let them go. But I, I try to keep pretty rigidly to the three minute rule. You mentioned how the council members can always, you know, say, hey, this resolution is not enough. We need more information, whatever, and stuff like that. So the question that I want to ask about that is how best the process of each council member including yourself of getting yourself up to speed or educated on what the administration is doing on these issues how does that i guess information process work do you get is it like a is it a constant thing do you meet with the manager on a regular basis how does that work well i think e each council member handles it differently um and it depends on the issue frankly uh but the, the, the staff is generally always available. I mean, I, I usually, I go through the manager if I want to talk to somebody about ordinances or resolutions. I talk to the manager, our, 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 finance, our chief financial officer, Benjamin Nussbaum, about, you know, financial issues. But there, you ask for information. I mean, that's the goal, right? We need to be informed when we're making this decision and staff is uh -huh. the best way to get informed. So that, that's the way to do it. They make themselves very available to us. They will reach out once the, the, uh, the agenda has been sent out. Uh, usually we'll get a note from the manager saying, hey, I'm available to, to speak with any and all of you uh, about any issues you have. Uh, these are some of the issues that I see, um, you know, you may want to may want to focus on, but that's generally the way it goes. Let's see. So the Key Biscayne referendum number two, the village charter provides a limit on the village's total debt. On method of calculating the total debt limit is based upon the percentage of the total assessed value of all property within the village. It is proposed that this method of calculating be modified from 1% of the total asset value of all property within the village to 2%. Right. So what's so, going on here? Well, 
this is look where we are is we we've approved the general obligation bond of 100 million dollars back in 2020 um our mm -hmm. debt cap as it stands is, as as you, as you just said it's 1% of our total value our total value is about 9.2 billion right now which means 1% is 92 million dollars we already know that we are going to spend more than 92 million on all the resiliency projects that we have Right. We, we know we've got the, the flooding issues. We've got beach issues. Um, we've got undergrounding. We have a number of things on the back bay. We're going to have to do some work on our seawalls. Uh, we've got a lot of things that we've got to do. And the fact is those things cost money. Now, we anticipate because we've passed the bond, we are probably higher on the priority list for the federal and state government in terms of, of getting money coming down to us. We're going to have to have skin in the game in order to get that financing. So I believe that the smart move is to move the cap up to 2%. That would give us about 184, I think, million dollar in room as opposed to the 92. Um, and, and look, you know, the, the, the whole argument of, oh, they just want to increase our debt. In, in when, I, when I took office, our outstanding debt was about $23.4 million. As of this past budget that we just approved, our, our debt, our outstanding debt is $8.9 million. So everybody in this village wants to keep our debt level as low as possible. But the fact mm. is we've got a lot of things that we've got to do. Um, the stormwater project is going to be a big one. Uh, the underground is going to be a big one. The back bay, the, the seawall is going to be a big one. And, and we've got to be ready to, to, to handle those things. Uh, you know, the idea of waiting until... We have everything lined up to, to establish our credit limit. It's just, that's nonsensical. I mean, if, if you know, you're going to build a house, you want to know how much money you have the capacity to expend on that house, right? We want to do the same thing with the village. We're, all of this money is an investment in our community. It's intended to increase property values as opposed to those people who, you know, want to, want to fight this and decrease property values. So this, this doesn't mean obviously that that we are already indebted. That can be confused. Like you said, we were at 23 million, now we're at 8 million. And this, this is going to give us the ability to secure the financing that we need in right. order to make all these changes for the future. Doesn't mean, look, and again, it doesn't mean people shouldn't be paying attention. We're going to pay attention to our debt levels and we're going to, we're going to make sure we keep them as low as possible, but let's give ourselves the flexibility to get these things done. This village has always been fiscally responsible, and they're always leading the way and getting things done to improve the village. Um, so the council rather. So I, I feel like I, I feel giving the council the flexibility in terms of our debt is, is the smart move. Okay. So number three, keeps gain referendum number three, the village charter provides a limit of the total debt incurred by the village. It is proposed that the village charter be amended to provide that the total debt of the village may be exceeded if approved by a majority vote of the electors in any referendum held after November 2022. All right. Okay. So, so this is sort of, in a way, it's an alternative, but it's also supplemental to, to referendum number two mm -hmm. in that this would give the opportunity to the folk, to the people of the village, to the residents, to the voters, to determine if we wanted to exceed the debt cap. You know, debt, having debt cap, debt caps are not normal in, in well, at least in the state of Florida. Uh, I think Miami-Dade, we're one of three communities that have a debt cap, but this would allow for, if, if two doesn't pass, or even if two passes and we get to a point, you know, I think the quote is right now 250 million. We need to do it. If we needed to spend that money, we, the people would have the opportunity to say, you know what? Yes, that that's, it makes sense why you're doing this. We should issue the bonds. We should, we should get the money. We should invest in our community. Um, so that, that's what it is. It was, it was an alternative and or supplemental to, uh, to referendum two. And when you mean that we need 200 million to do what, to do all these changes, to do all the about? infrastructure the walls, projects, yeah, all the, all the resiliency and sustainability projects we've been talking about, the beaches, the, the seawalls, the, the undergrounding, the, the flooding, all those things, they're going to take money and we've got to be ready for it. So just to fully understand the differences between number two and number three, number two talks about our 
debt capacity based on our property values. Right. Right. We are going from 1%, which is what we already have, which is approximately, you 90 said 90 million. million? Yeah, just about 90. To two, right, about. And then 2% to 100, approximately 180 million. Right. Right. Our capacity to borrow, increasing our capacity to borrow. Correct. And the number three says is if you wanted to go above that, right? So what it, whether it remains as is, which is 90 million, or we take it to 180 million. Right. If we wanted to go above that, voting yes on this would say that, okay, we can, but we need to go to referendum on the next voting cycle Correct. for the people to vote. Correct. And, uh, you know, look, I'm I'm not a fan of, of government by referendum, but I do understand if we're going to go above whatever level we've established, then yes, the people should have a voice in that. And I think that's, that's the best way to do it. Um, I, again, I'm a proponent of two because I think, you know, giving council – the, the wherewithal to handle all the projects that we've asked them to take on, uh, you need you need the debt cap at 180. So you like number two then? From Yes, I like number two. I also like okay. number three. I like to have the even the more flexibility. I think we need okay. to be we need to be financially nimble. We have to be flexible. We've got to be able to adapt and, and overcome any challenges that come at us in the coming years. Okay. And by we, I mean a village. Sorry, not, I, I, I'm I'm not going to be on this council. I want to reiterate, this is flexibility for the folks sitting up there on the dais. So moving on to number four, Key Biscayne uh, referendum number four. The village charter requires that certain text amendments to the zoning code or other land development regulations be approved by majority vote of the electors. Right. The proposed charter amendment would allow approval of such text amendments by majority vote of the electors, vote of five of seven council members, or unanimous vote of the council when two or more council members are required to abstain pursuant to Florida law. Wow, that right. was a hard read. <laughs> Yeah, look, none of these are uh, fun to read, but they're they're the way you have to write these things to make sure they're completely compliant and legal. Um, so, look, back in 2007, uh, Dr. Kelly uh, and I think Max Puyanic came together and put forward a charter amendment. There's a lot of stress in the community about the Senesta redevelopment, right? There was concerns because at the time, some of the first projects that came at us had these monstrosity buildings uh, right up against single family homes. And that was within our code. Um, there was also a push to, ch to make changes to our zoning to allow for condo hotels, where our code at that time did not, and still does not, uh, didn't allow condo hotels. Um, so that was their concern. And they, that was why this referendum was pushed. It won. Uh, I wasn't in favor of it at the, at the time, for many of the reasons for which this is being proposed. Um, and then it was again brought to another uh, referendum and it passed. Um, the problem has been that has really curtailed council's ability to amend our zoning code on, on more mundane and simple things like definitions. Um, it's really sort of held us back from being, we had a Zork in 2000, I wanna say 2010 or 11, and we couldn't propose a lot of the changes. We couldn't put them forward because they would require a referendum. So we couldn't really make the, these changes we wanted to make. Um, I think this gives us flexibility. I do understand, you know, there, there's, there's there's been some pushback from people uh, saying that they want to reserve some rights uh, to, to make certain decisions. Like, for example, if we were to decide that we wanted to increase... Uh, density or, or change, change the zoning, let's say something crazy, change single family zoning to commercial. I mean, things that have a, a, a major impact or could have a major impact in our community should be voted on by the electorate. I agree with that 100%. I'm going to propose uh, tomorrow night at our council meeting that the next council, um, that the next council enact an ordinance that, that lists those items that must go to the electors. Uh, meaning which 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 zoning decisions must come come to us the people uh, because that is one of the things as you said you know one of the things is would allow approval by a majority of the vote of the electors 
comma, vote of five of seven council members or unanimous vote of council when two or more council members are uh, required to abstain. Um, and, you know, the supermajority works. I, again, I, I think, but I, I, I would like to see the next council be very specific as to what must go to the people and what can be done by either the people or a supermajority vote. Okay. Yeah, just to be clear, the, the electorate and the electors are the people. The, the, the residents, the voters. The residents, okay. okay. <clears throat> so just to just to clarify on uh, number four, where it says the proposed charter amendment would allow approval of such text amendments by majority vote of the electors, vote of five to seven council members, or unanimous vote of the council. This, these are options, right? So we're going to go from right. what we have now, which is it needs to go to the people on these right. changes, to allowing the council members to make that decision, whether it goes to the people or they make the decision and so forth, right? Correct. A couple of, I mean, well, there, there's also concern about the lack of details on this one. Well, I, I think that's, again, and that's why I want to, uh, I'm going to recommend that the next council create an ordinance that specifies which must, which items must go to, to the electorate must go to the voters. Nobody up there is for overdevelopment. I mean, you know, Joe Rasco and the, the incorporate the original incorporators, they incorporated because of overdevelopment. They're, they're concerned about development and that they wanted to, to, to stop it. Um, this council has always been very mindful of, of the need to keep development to a reasonable level. Nobody wants to overdevelop this key. Everybody loves the key the way it is, um, but we need to be nimble. There are certainly, there, there are also mechanisms, I think people are forgetting that, let's say, you know, let's say a council decided to take something that we all wanted. Let's say five members decided they wanted to, uh, let's do something crazy again, the single family homes, they wanna make it uh, commercial over there on Heather Lane, uh, Heather Drive. Um, we, the people could then, we could do a petition. We have 10% of the electorate to sign a petition to put out a referendum on that issue. And we would be able to, to turn that back. Um, and I can assure you, if, if, if overdevelopment is on somebody's mind, that they're, they're on the wrong island uh, because the vast majority of us want to control density. We wanna control development. We're not looking to do anything untoward toward our island. 10% okay. of 10 of the voters. So in our case, I think it's about 780 signatures. Um, but look, if somebody came in with some sort of development issue, we could get those signatures in, in, I'd, I'd stand outside Wind Dixie to get those signatures in a minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> look forward to seeing that, but we'll hopefully doesn't get to that point. The, the referendum, I just want to be clear that referendum, that the question, it gives us a little more flexibility and we need the flexibility on, on small changes to the zoning code that we don't right now have the capacity to, the capability of, of dealing with without going to a referendum, which is an expensive and unnecessary process on certain items, certain discrete items. Got it. So keep his game referendum number five, the village charter does not currently require council member primaries. The proposed charter amendment requires a council primary if the number of candidates is equal to or greater than three times the number of open council positions. Candidates receiving the most votes would proceed to the general election, provided that the number of candidates would not exceed twice the number of open council positions. I right. love these. I love these <laughs> referendum uh, <laughs> explanations. Yeah, so, so this this question is basically saying because every two years we have three seats come up, right? We have three seats. Yeah. They're in staggered terms of four years. So every two years you have three three seats come up. So that would mean that if more than nine people signed up to run for office in any given year, there would have to be a primary. Mm -hmm. The problem with this, and I, I am not in favor of this. Um, I understand the intent. The intent is is to sort of get away from. To, to make sure that the most people are voting for these, the, the top three, that we're not, we're not so diluted that, that some small minority gets somebody in because, that, because they were able to focus on their one person. Um, but if that's what happens, that's what happens. You know, this, this is, you've got to run good candidates and, and get them elected. Um, this just, the, the problem really that I see with this is this lengthens the election cycle 
because we would have to have our mayors sign up in June because we may have to have the uh, the primary. You know, if you have more than two people run for mayor, as we did this year, you need to have a primary in August. That makes a long election cycle for that position. Uh, but to have that for council members through the summer, I mean, that's just a lot. I, you know, having having done what one, two, three, four, four campaigns, and I got you know I didn't have to do one in 2020, so four campaigns. It's a lot of work, and it, it's a lot to ask people who are volunteers, who are giving of their time, uh, to to start so early on this process. So, so I, I'm more in favor of let them all run, uh, starting in August, and and the top three vote getters get the seats. And that that should be it. All right. But I do understand why. I, I understand the intent. I just, I think it's it's fine the way it is. So Key Biscayne referendum number six. It is proposed to create a new section of the village charter to require courtesy electronic public notice. The proposed charter amendment would require the village to post courtesy electronic public notice on the village website or through other means of electronic communication for regular council meetings, workshops, sunshine meetings, and all meetings requiring public notice. Right. So, right. So right now, the requirement is that it be posted on the the, on the, um, the, the board, right, in Village Hall. And then usually, I think it most have got to be a noticed in the local paper. Um, you know, we're, we're in the electronic age. Right, people get their information on the internet. They get their information through through uh, emails and texts, um, and unfortunately, sometimes chats. Uh, so, what this would do was would require that the village push out information in more forms. I think they're already doing it, really, but I think this is a good idea. I think that the look, the more information we can get out to people, the more informed we can make people, the better off we all are. And if people have noticed, then they can come to the meetings and they can participate. And that's what keeps this government going. So I'm, I'm a big fan of that one. Awesome. I mean, the Village Connect is very good in uh, summarizing what happens in the in the council meetings and in, uh, informing people of events. So if you haven't signed up for the Village uh, Connect, go to the website and check it out. It's a newsletter that comes out on a regular. It's really good. So Yeah, agreed. Nice plug. Um, helping out. <laughs> And finally, number seven, Kibiskane Referendum 7. It is proposed to create a new section of the village charter to require the village council to adopt an ordinance after November 2022 election, establishing supplemental procedures and guidelines to ensure compliance with open meeting laws. Every two years Thereafter, the village council would be required to review the ordinance to determine if any modifications to the ordinance are necessary. Right. Okay. So this is kind of an interesting one. It had there are two reasons why this this has come forward. First, uh, one of the folks on the on the uh, the charter revision commission felt that um, the prior council there were there were way too many um, there were too many sunshine meetings. Too much was going on, you know, where uh, people were calling sunshine meetings. We actually had one incident where a sunshine meeting was called and our former mayor um, actually was investigated by the state attorney's office for violating the sunshine law. Uh, okay. Wound up costing us $35,000 as a community. Um, they declined to prosecute. Uh, the, they decided to, to close the case when they found her to be contrite uh, and term limited. So they didn't pursue it any further. But what it did was highlight that, you know, things happen in these sunshine meetings that maybe shouldn't be. Um, so I'm, I very much favor this one. And, and another source was actually our, our local uh, journalists wanted it because they want to have notice of it. They want to know where these things are taking place and they'd like to have them recorded. And I, I don't see any problem with that. You know, if you're having a meeting in the sunshine, you should be recording them. I think that that's that's not a bad idea. Trying to remember the last sunshine meeting I had. It's it's been a few years. I think it's a good thing. Look, open government's the best form of government. Making sure people are held accountable is good. Um, and so I think the more we can do to make sure that all of this is on the up and up, the, the better off we are as a community. Yeah, and sunshine meetings is basically when elected officials want to have conversations between each other. That is business. I mean, when Correct. they have a conversation, it's business for the people's business. The right. people have the right to to know when and how they can listen in. That's right. Absolutely. Right. 
All right. Well, Mayor Mike Davey, thank you so much. I think this is really walks us through the seven uh, charter referendums so that people can uh, hopefully listen in and learn a little bit more about them before they make a vote. Yeah. And look, and the one thing I will tell people is if, if you've got additional questions, everybody's got my cell phone. Uh, but, you know, reach out to people, find out from different people what their views are. You know, we, we don't all agree on these referenda issues, um, which is fine. Uh, but we do have to continue to work together uh, for the village. And I, I just, I want people to come out. I want them to vote. I want them to be informed voters um, and, and be informed participants in your community. November 8th doesn't end your obligation to be a part of the government. You know, it's our government and you need to step up to that podium and, uh, you know, use your three minutes when there's an issue that you feel is important, but pay attention and, and understand what's going on because it's, it's your money, it's your community. Now, I want to take this opportunity, as we mentioned, you served for eight years as council member and four years as mayor. So right. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your service, because here I know I know it's it's a great community. It's a tough community, but uh, you've done a great job from what from what it. I've seen and what I hear. So thank you for your service, because I know this is this is all free stuff here, all volunteer. And you took time away from your family and for the loved ones and from your time to to serve the community. So thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Look, I, 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 I really did love it. I, you know, it was, it, it was my honor to be the mayor. It is my honor to continue to be the mayor for 29 more days at least. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm happy to have done it, but I, I'm, I'm glad, glad there's new blood coming in and, and I'm glad there there's, uh, I'm, I'm glad there's good people coming up. Awesome. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Have a great one.